the final item of business is members' business debate on motion 9328 in the name of John McAlpine on the economic potential of Robert Burns. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to contribute to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Joan McAlpine to open the debate. I can't find her. Really. Oh, there she is. Put my glasses on. <laughs> I call on Joan McAlpine to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's now 15 years since the BBC programme Burns the Brand attempted to quantify in hard cash terms what our national bard contributes to Scotland's contemporary economy. The producer, David Stenhouse, commissioned a World Bank economist who calculated that Burns made us 157 million per annum in year-round tourism and merchandising, including the bonanza of the supper season with spending on hospitality, whiskey, haggis, kilt hire and even paying the piper. Now, £157 million pounds is a tidy sum back in 2003, uh, and it would have left the impoverished poor uncharacteristically lost for words. But it did not include activity out with Scotland, and it took place long before the opening of the Burns Birthplace Museum with its 300,000 visitors a year, and Scotland's 390,000 winter festival programme uh, with Burns Night as the keystone. It also took place uh, before the Watershed Homecoming year of 2009 uh, for Burns' 250th anniversary, which itself resulted in an additional 360 million of visitor spend and, of course, reached out to Scotland's diaspora uh, as never before. Uh, nor did the 157 million figure include the free advertising and promotion that our country and its businesses get via Burnsy and Goodwill. Uh, and not just on the Barnes' birthday, uh, but through things like uh, Old Lang Syne, uh, when the whole world welcomes in the new year in Scots, uh, a song which has been recorded by hundreds of stars from Jimi Hendrix to Mariah Carey. Any economic study conducted today would surely find that Burns' capital had increased exponentially, and uh, if, God forbid, he was a listed company, his share price would be through the roof of his old clay biggin. And that, presiding officer, is the purpose of this debate. It's high time that we look seriously at the value of Burns the Brand and updated the 2003 study. Of course, presiding officer, we cannot put a price on the cultural value of Burns. He is the most significant Scotsman of his millennium, in my view. He cemented our national identity um, and self-confidence. He represents democracy, equality, the importance of universal education, uh, the lyrical power of the Scots language, and so much more, including peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure in his own words. But there is no contradiction between honouring Burns as an artist and also recognising his commercial worth. Uh, I'm indebted to the Centre for Robert Burns Studies at the University of Glasgow and Professor Murray Pittock, Pro Vice Principal of the University and Bradley Chair of English Literature, uh, for advising me on this debate. Uh, and I would like to welcome Professor Pittock and his colleagues uh, to the gallery today, although I have to say that they are not responsible for the content of my speech. Uh, the Centre uh, for Robert Burns Studies has itself uh, been an income generator and a, a job creator since it was uh, founded in 2007, as indeed befits the track record of our world-class universities here in Scotland. Students from all over the world come there to study Burns uh, and other writers of his period, such as John Galt and Alan Ramsey. And the centre secured an Arts and Humanities Research Council grant, AHRC grant, worth 1.1 million uh, towards the project editing Robert Burns for the 21st century. This new multi-volume edition published by Oxford University Press is edited by the Centre's Professor Jerry Carruthers and the accompanying website and social media mean that everyone can engage and benefit from their expertise and the Centre provides strategic support to the National Burns Collection which is housed across 26 different sites in Glasgow, Ayrshire, Edinburgh and in Fries and Galloway. Uh, the website burnscotland.com brings that collection together in a way that serves both the general public, the tourist and the scholar. And I can particularly recommend the interactive maps that allow you to see all the different locations and what's there. Now, I know that other members will talk about other parts of Scotland, and Ayrshire in particular. I know there are members uh, from Ayrshire here. Uh, I would, don't have time to mention everything, uh, but uh, the collection, uh, I would like to particularly point out to Debris and Galloway, where many of the collection sites are. Uh, the Burns House the Museum in Dumfries, um, and, of course, Ellisland Farm. 
uh, on the banks of the Nith, and the Dumfries Globe Inn, where he enjoyed a dram and romanced the barmaid and a park. is a, a piece of living history where you can view stanzas uh, scratched on the window panes, as I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has done, and sit fast by an ingle in the poet's own chair. The Globe is a major venue in Dumfries' Big Burn Supper Festival, running from the 18th to 28th of January this year, which is the biggest Burns event in the Winter Festival's programme, and has seen audiences grow every year. Uh, last year saw a 16% increase in ticketed events, and of course it's a really important aspect of town centre uh, regeneration. The proliferation of Burns festivals is a relatively recent development, but Burns suppers, which began after the poet's death, even in the 21st century, continue to multiply exponentially. And many are, of course, uh, run by volunteers, such as those through the Robert Burns World Federation, which has 250 members, clubs worldwide. But, but nowadays, all sorts of people around the world are having burn suppers, business organisations, hotels, restaurants, loose networks of friends. Uh, well, they'll all raise their glasses and sharpen their dicks this month uh, because Burns is fashionable. Um, if you just look on the booking service, uh, Eventbrite, it shows uh, in London alone, Jamie Oliver is hosting a Burns night celebration at £50 a person, uh, including Glenfiddich cocktails. And Fortnum and Mason's event comes, at somewhat, comes in at somewhat pricier, £75 a head. Uh, Anta, the design, design and textile interiors company, is offering haggis canopies and 20% off in its showrooms. So from Washington DC to Kuala Lumpur, these events are increasing demand for Scottish produce. Uh, the Premier Butcher, Simon Howey, says a third of the haggis in the UK is sold in the three weeks around the 25th of January, and year-round sales in the UK are now 8 million. Uh, and there's slightly more haggis actually sold in the Burns period in England than in Scotland. Uh, and of course, we all know that whisky sales are booming with exports of £125 every single second. Uh, Around the world, many people get their first taste of malt whiskey and haggis at Burns Supper, and of course, they, they come back for more. And increasingly, they come back for more samples of other Scottish produce, like oat cakes and craft beers and Scottish gins. Many of the international events are held by chambers of commerce, and they sell themselves quite openly as networking opportunities. It's not really possible to see all these disparate events on a single site, but I wonder whether perhaps maybe there is potential in exploring that so that exporting companies can, can take advantage of this amazing network. Um, but as much as the deals struck, as much as the sales of our produce, there's a soft power of the poet to consider. Uh, Ireland has St. Patrick's Day, of course, and it's absolutely great fun, but the mythical snake-killing saint doesn't quite have Rabi's contemporary resonance. Uh, he celebrates universalism and is now everyone's national poet for a day. Uh, he's embraced by Scotland's own diverse communities, of course, and I know with uh, pleasure the briefing from Bemis today, the Organisation for Scotland's Ethnic and Cultural Minority Communities. Uh, their community burns events this year include the Gifnook Hebrew community, uh, the Glasgow Afghan United Organisation, the African Caribbean Women's Association, and the 25th anniversary of Celtic Connections this year sees Bemis celebrate Burns in a grand multicultural Cayley at Glasgow's Fruit Market. Burns is for everyone, and he's for everyone all year round, not just on Burns Night. Camperdown in Victoria, Australia, is holding a Robert Burns Festival this May, and it's showcasing a lot of Scottish talent. Uh, and of course, his native Ayrshire is uh, having Burns Fest in the same month. Uh, Burns continues to inspire other artists and makers and manufacturers of original merchandise. And some of it will uh, find its way into the Wee Box, which is an amazing uh, initiative, a, a subscription home delivery hamper, which was highlighted in, in Vogue magazine uh, last month, aimed at all who identify with or admire our culture. And each month it arrives with the uh, quirky original gifts of a high quality, mindings from home. It says, uh, this month the Wee Box contains uh, Craig McGill's ultimate Burns Supper book by Lewis Press with, with a foreword uh, by Professor uh, Pittock. Um, it's a DIY guide allowing even more people around the world to join in the world's biggest party of poetry. Presiding officer, Burns the brand is inseparable from Scotland the brand. 
And the index which ranks the reputation of countries, uh, the Anhalt GFK Roper Brand Index, puts Scotland 15th place out of 50 countries, which is really quite an astonishing uh, performance. And I think Burns contributes uh, to that success quite considerably by enhancing the way others see us. Uh, first and foremost, of course, he enriches our culture. But by investing in his cultural legacy, we also enrich our country and the prosperity of the Scottish people who keep his immortal memory alive. Thank you very much. Well, Ms McAlpin, I think I'm due one of these wee boxes for letting you speak on for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, move on to the debate, and may I call Willie Coffey to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and thank you and congratulations to Joan McAlpin in bringing forward this worthy motion on the economic impact of Robert Burns. I suppose the first thing to say is that it's actually quite difficult to establish accurate values to the continuing economic impact of Burns on local or even Scottish economies, but it is substantial. The books, translations, the suppers, the memorabilia, the whiskey, the tourist facilities, visits to Ayrshire and beyond, not to discount the international dimension that Joan McAlpin mentioned. All of these are substantial indeed. They're ever present and diverse and still growing after 259 years. If we had a revenue line in the Scottish budget every year attributed to income from Robert Burns, I'm certain it would be significant enough to justify its inclusion in Mr Mackay's annual budget statement to the Parliament. In East Ayrshire, we know that there are about a million tourist visits each year, generating about £90 million and supporting over 1,600 jobs. And Burns will be a major contributor to these figures. But what they don't include, of course, is all of the associated Burns activities that go unrecorded. There are about 5,000 visits to the Mauchlin Museum each year, which is free, plus a number of other locations in and around the area, including the Burns Monument and Genealogy Centre in Kilmarnock, Miss Gill Farm, where Burns lived for about four years, and Burns World Federation will soon be moving into their new premises in Kilmarnock Town Centre, not too far away from where it all started, of course, with the publication of his Kilmarnock edition in July 1786. The Federation, if not directly being promoting itself as a visitor attraction, may well find that there is demand for all things relating to Burns in this very central and attractive location in the town. The jewel in the crown, of course, is the magnificent Burns National Heritage Park in Alloway, which attracts well over 300,000 visitors each year to that stunning location with the cottage of the Kirk, Tams Brig, set in beautiful gardens adjacent to the Brigadoon Hotel, showing what is possible with significant investment to deliver the kind of quality visitor experience that local and international visitors expect. So Burns continues to make his money and he's even on our money. On a Clydesdale Bank and Bank of Scotland notes, he's translated into over 40 languages, including Faroese and Esperanto, and he's celebrated in every corner of the world. But we might, presiding officer, have a wee bit of work to do to improve the standing of Burns in Japan, as some of the translations, when you see them back in English, might explain why our Japanese friends are a little bemused at times. Apparently, those immortal lines from Tuahagas Fear for your honest twenty face great chieftain of the pudding race, have emerged as good luck to your honest friendly face, great king of the sausages. <laughs> Leaving our Japanese friends wondering what the fuss is all about. So we might have a little way to go there to improve our offering to our Japanese friends. Presiding officer, it's been a pleasure to offer this contribution and once again to speak in a Robert Burns debate in this wonderful parliament of ours and to thank my colleague Joan McAlpin for giving us this opportunity and to wonder what the Bard would make of it all some 259 years after that blast of January wind brought him into this world and into all our lives. Thank you. John Scott followed by Emma Harper. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by congratulating Joan McAlpine on securing her motion for debate this evening and note it is one of the most comprehensive motions I have supported in a very long time. And with your encouragement, presiding officer, uh, may I begin by giving you the opening lines of Tam O'Shanter, a uh, famous poem by Robert Burns. When Chapman Billies leave the street and Ruthie neighbours neighbors meet, as market days are wearing late and folk begin to tack the gate, and we sit boozing at the nappy, getting foo and unca happy, we think now, and the long Scotch miles, the mosses, the waters, 
slats and styles that lie between us and our heim, where sits our silky sullen dame. Gale nor bruise, let gale and storms, nurse nor wrath to keep it warm. This truth, when earnest Tamashanta, is he fi air, enech did canter, all dear, where near a tune surpasses for honest men and bonny lasses. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, as an Ayrshire man born and bred, and as the MSP for here for the last 17 years, it's a great pleasure and indeed a privilege to speak in this debate. As a son of the soil myself, I was brought up to have an affinity with Burns, the Ayrshire ploughman, and the language of Burns is still the language of much of the farming community in Ayrshire today. The particular dialect of Broad Scots I learned at my mother's knee has given me insights into his remarkable work not so easily accessed by others. For example, how many of you in this room, apart from Emma Harper, knows what to spin a foal would mean? Answers in a postcard. That Burns, as part of the Scottish Enlightenment, has had a remarkable impact on Ayrshire and Scottish people, as well as the Scottish diaspora and beyond, is beyond doubt. His poetry and letters have influenced millions of people, including philosophers, presidents of the United States, as well as working men and women the world over, who so readily identify with his works. As the MSP for Ayr, I've been very lucky to be invited to many Burns suppers over the years, and one of my favourite ones is the Newton Burns Club, where Alec Neil and I both spoke last year. And as the MSP for Ayr in January, I regard myself as eating haggis for Ayrshire at this time of year, and so I'm indeed fortunate that I enjoy it as well. However, today we are debating the economic impact of Burns, and certainly I know this is very significant for Ayrshire particularly, but Scotland as a whole generally, and I endorse all of what Joan McAlpine has already drawn to our attention. The Robert Burns Birthplace Museum in Alloway is a must-see destination of choice for those interested in his work, and the museum contains many artefacts from his life and times. And while I'm open to correction, I believe between two and 300,000 people a year visit this museum and Burns Cottage, as well as the soon to be refurbished Burns Monument. And this benefits the hotels and restaurants in Ayr and Ayrshire. Indeed, many hotels, restaurants and bars in Ayrshire have memorable names, some of them taken from his most famous works, such as the Brigadoon, the Twa Dogs, Suitors, Willie Wassels, and Robert Burns' influence and attitudes still influence the way of life in Ayrshire today. And while there is already a whole industry built around Burns in Ayrshire and Scotland, much more could be done to increase visitor numbers to Ayrshire. A relatively recent innovation is the Burns Humanitarian Award made every year to a suitable, deserving and emblematic person selected from a worldwide stage which recognises their particular contribution and which publicises Ayrshire and Scotland as well. Several festivals at different times of year acclaim his work in Ayr and Ayrshire and De Vries and elsewhere and bring welcome visitors to our relatively undiscovered part of southwest Scotland. Now while I applaud the success of the North Coast 500 route in terms of tourist development, what many visitors to Scotland are not even aware of is the magnificent land and seascapes of the Firth of Clyde, the Solway Firth, and the A75 and the A77 coastal routes are as good, if not better, than the North Coast 500 route, and all were travelled on by Burns in his day as an exciseman and local farmer. Southwest Scotland, but particularly Ayrshire, is the hidden jewel in the crown of Scottish tourism, with uncluttered roads, easily navigated by camper vans, take note, magnificent restaurants, such as the recently refurbished treehouse in Ayr, and a warm welcome at every hotel and bed and breakfast awaits those who journey to the west to see for themselves the legendary sunsets over Arran and the Firth of Clyde. We in Ayrshire, notwithstanding the foregoing, are not good enough at making the many millions worldwide with Ayrshire and Scottish ancestry, as well as an interest in Burns, aware of what Southwest Scotland has to offer. And I'm not even mentioning the championship golf courses of Royal Troon, Prestwick and Trump Turnbury, or the 40 local authority courses, so, golf courses so easily available and within 20 minutes of air. 
Nor have I mentioned Dumfries House, a second home of the Duke of Rothsey or Culane Castle, also designed by Robert Adam and perched romantically on the cliffs above the Firth of Clyde. Robert Burns, his work, his legacy, his landscapes, are all part of the treasure trove waiting to be discovered by active tourists making their way west off the M74. And I commend them and Joan McAlpine's motion to Parliament today. Thank you for your indulgence. Call Emma Harper to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to add my congratulations also to my colleague Joan McAlpine for securing this debate. What a comprehensive com contribution that is absolutely commendable. As an enthusiastic Burnsy and an immediate past president of Dumfries Ladies Burns Club No. 1, I'm delighted to speak this evening. We are eternally grateful to Robert Burns for his cultural legacy and contribution to Scots language and poetry. However, we rarely speak about his lasting or potential economic impact in Scotland, which is realised mainly through the tourism and food and drink industries, two very important sectors to Scotland's rural economy. I've been involved in Burns clubs for many years and even attended Robert Burns celebrations when I lived in Los Angeles. So I'm well aware of the international influence Burns has. Even in LA, I was able to source my chieftain of the pudding race, my haggis, my FDA approved haggis from a butcher in Oregon whose last name was actually Lamb. <clears throat> Burns Night was an event marked by many. Similar events will take place on January the 25th every year in some of the most far-flung corners of the globe, from Tanzania to Delhi to St. Petersburg. And I was well chuffed to read the Bemis briefing ahead of this debate too. What an influence Robert Burns truly has on us all. There's more than 170 statues across the world um, dedicated to Robert Burns, more than Christopher Columbus, Queen Victoria, and even another writer, Charles Dickens. 14 of these statues can be found in the USA, which isn't surprising, as President Abraham Lincoln counted himself as a fan of Robert Burns. And Bob Dylan cited a red, red rose as one of his greatest creative inspirations. Many have speculated what exactly it is about the bard that makes his legacy so wide-reaching and enduring. Whether it was his talent as a poet, his heartfelt politics, or the universal humane themes of his writing, we are privileged that his work continues to benefit Scotland economically as well as culturally. There is no question that visitors to Scotland come from across the world to attractions such as Robert Burns' birthplace museum in the beautiful Ayrshire village of Alloway and to visit the cottage where he was born. Or the Globe Inn has been mentioned on Dumfries High Street, established in 1610. Robert Burns started frequenting what is now one of Scotland's oldest host hostelries or his favourite house while he was working at the farm at Ellisland. As Joan McAlpine has highlighted, in Dumfries and Galloway, Burns Night celebrations can contribute significantly to the local economy. She mentioned the Big Burn Supper. It runs for 11 days across Dumfries and is now in its seventh year. The festival is intended as a winter gathering, as well as a celebration of the meaning behind Burns Night. It is a deliberate attempt to encourage people out of their homes to socialise with each other during the dark January evenings. In Dumfries, the economic impact of burn season is evident and can be measured when I chat to the local butchers who tell me they, of course, benefit from the spike in sales of haggis. And in turn, Scottish farmers profit from the demand for authentic Scotch lamb. Last, the last comprehensive piece of research showed that Scottish tourism benefits from the, the birth of its most famous poet by 157 million each year. These findings do date from 2003, and it would certainly be interesting to see updated figures. While we can measure how many haggis and Scottish tatties are purchased and kilts hired, as Joan McAlpin has mentioned, it is perhaps more difficult to quantify how Burns the brand has helped to establish Scotland's reputation on the world stage as a place of culture, beauty, and synonymous, synonymous with the values of the bard, from egalitarianism and intellectualism to environmentalism. Fortunately, that doesn't stop us appreciating the financial as well as the cultural rewards. Presiding officer, 
I am welcome the support for a southwest tourist route that John Scott has described. It's actually a project that I'm pr currently promoting and involved in. So I welcome any support to get more tourists into the southwest of Scotland. And on closing, presiding officer, I would like to pay tribute to the many sonsi faced volunteers across Scotland who are instrumental to the success of Burns Night. For my own experience in Dumfries and Galloway, the world of Burns would have a hard time existing and competing without the DNG Burns Association and the Robert Burns World Federation volunteers. So thank, again, thank you once again, Joan McAlpine, for securing this debate today. Thanks. Call Alex Rowley to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Presiding officer, can I also congratulate Joan McAlpine for securing this debate through her motion, which I was delighted to support. My family on my mum's side were very much into Burns, so I grew up listening to Burns' poems, songs and stories, although I must confess that talent for Burns passed me by. But I do take a strong interest in celebrating Burns and join my love of haggis, totties and neeps. In the Burns season, there will be thousands of Burns suppers, some very grand, some in community halls, and some in people's living rooms all over Scotland and the rest of the UK, indeed across the world. As Joan McAlpine says in her motion, this will generate much business supporting jobs within the Scottish economy. It is also the case that the Burns legacy plays a major part in promoting Scotland across the world. Indeed, I was quite surprised to learn that other than Queen Victoria and Christopher Columbus, Burns has more statues dedicated to him around the world than any other non-religious figure. Presiding officer, Scotland's sense of promoting outward-looking cultural identity is flourishing to the point where the readers of Rough Guide, an online tourism worldwide blog, voted Scotland the most beautiful country in the world. And surely Burns is a significant contributor to this, along with our world-renowned food and drink and glorious glens, lochs, towns, villages, cities and coastlines. But can I say most important for me in this, the burn season, is that children in schools up and down Scotland will be learning about the amazing works of Robert Burns that has stood the test of time. They will be learning about Scottish culture and what it was like to live in that period of Scottish history. Burns wrote about real people, about real emotions and the levels of inequality that existed for so many at that time. I do wonder what he would have to say about the levels of inequality that are still here, if not more prevalent, over 200 years since his time. I know he was not impressed with politicians of his time, describing them as a parcel of rogues. I do wonder. So in conclusion, Joan McAlpine is absolutely right to highlight the importance of Robert Burns for Scotland's culture and our economy. Long may it continue. Call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And like others, let me uh, thank Joan McAlpine for the opportunity to speak on on this subject. And as is often the case uh, when I have a new intern, um, Chase Lindemann started with me yesterday, I set them the challenge of writing a speech for me. So Chase has written uh, tonight's speech. Now Chase has come from the United States, he's not been to Scotland before, but I think it's uh, an indication of the reach of Burns that in a very short space of time he's produced what I think is a, an insightful and interesting speech uh, on Robert Burns. One of the things he's identified is that uh, Sophie Craig, who's a 16-year-old member of the Alloway Burns Club in Air, has been given the opportunity to travel to Hungary to promote uh, the works of Robert Burns. She'll be reciting poetry and songs at the Corinthia Hotel for over 300 guests, helping to raise money for sick and disadvantaged children in Central Europe. So the financial benefits of Robert Burns are more diverse than perhaps even we perhaps selfishly looking in our own mirror uh, thought about. Um, she is a young adult showcasing the power that Robert Burns 
poetry has to unite people in all walks of life. A poem like uh, To a Mouse transcends socioeconomic status, allowing all and any to delight in the humorous comparisons and linkages between the lives of mice and men. The universality of his message uh, makes it easy for Burns' poetry to reach non-Scottish ears. And of course, his poems permeate the minds of people across the planet. The likes of haggis and whisky spread likewise, introducing more to Scottish culture, Scottish cuisine. And well done to the Parliament's canteen for providing the haggis today. Alas, no whisky, but uh, ho-hum, uh, there, there we are. Uh, between 2011 and 2015, uh, we exported £4.85 million pounds worth of haggis to 28 uh, different countries. And of course, whisky uh, has enjoyed an increase in exports uh, in 2013. 1.3 billion uh, bottles were exported, worth £4.37 million. Pounds. Tourism is a... Yes, I, I will. John Scott. It's my understanding that the Scottish Government has secured access to the American market for haggis now. Can you confirm that that is indeed correct, Mr Stevenson? Uh, Stuart Stevenson. I'm, a, a whisper tells me it might be Canada. The States may still be off. But I, I think, and I'm prepared to be corrected if necessary, that there are now some quite good vegetarian haggises, and I believe some of them are going to the States. Hopefully, the real thing will follow uh, quite, uh, quite soon. Returning to tourism, though, very important part of our e economy, and Burns is an important part of why people come here. The tartan, the bagpipes, whiskey tours, um, and, of course, our history, of which Burns is an important part. So thank you to Robert Burns for creating the opportunity and helping us there. And, of course, his poetry covers a wide range of themes, uh, from quite short poems to narrative tales of wonderful uh, complexity and, and interest. And of course, the use of the Scots language uh, has helped to introduce 20 million Scots Americans to the language of their an ancestry. Um, I note today that Kenneth, McCall uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, circulated a motion asking us to rename uh, Glasgow Presswick Airport to Robert Burns International Airport. I'm sure John Scott will be on that case. Um, that would be a good thing for Presswick and a good thing for Burns. Now, of course, Burns clubs don't just exist uh, as a means of cherishing the life and poetry of Robert Burns. They encourage the young to take an interest in the poet and poetry in general and songs and competitions. Um, clubs are an avenue for people of all uh, social classes. 25th of January, uh, people in Atlanta, Georgia, in Budapest, all the way down to Bendingo in Australia will celebrate the birth of our bard. And members of international Burns clubs will join millions of Scots for taking an evening of haggis, whiskey and poetry recital. For my part personally, I look forward to visiting your constituency uh, shortly, uh, presiding officer, with my colleague Ruth Maguire. I'm sure you will lay out the red carpet uh, for us as we uh, come to speak on Burns. I, my favourite place, um, the most prestigious place I've spoken, uh, was in the British Embassy in Paris, which is the most wonderful building uh, where I spoke to a Burns supper, and I have in the United States and elsewhere. The heaven sent ploughman has sent us a lot of enormous value, but I can't help, uh, before sitting down, reminding members that the Burns family actually came from the northeast of Scotland, presiding officer. Just before I, I call Oliver Mundell, I'm waiting for the minister to finish reading my note. Okay. <laughs> um, due to the number of speakers, we are going to run out of time shortly. Uh, so I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend debate by the short time necessary. And I invite Joan McAlpin to move a motion without notice. Uh, move the motion. Thank you very much. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That's therefore agreed. And I now call Oliver Mundell, who will be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I also begin by congratulating Joan McAlpine on securing this important debate on Burns. Uh, I must start by uh, saying that uh, Mr Stevenson should definitely uh, keep chase on in the speech writing department and 
as someone who's standing up to speak uh, without any speech at all and only a few notes, uh, I do ask people uh, to, to stick with me. Um, I'd um, like to also mention the fact that I am uh, proudly uh, wearing my Robert Burns uh, tie uh, for tonight's occasion, but it does come uh, with a confession because whilst the tie was bought in Scotland, uh, contributing to our Scottish economy, I did notice this morning uh, when, when putting it on uh, that it actually says made in England uh, on the back. Uh, so there are definitely uh, other parts of the United Kingdom uh, who also benefit significantly uh, from Robert Burns's global influence and reach. I also, as other uh, members have touched upon, want to talk about the big Burns supper in Dumfries. It's been a greatly uh, welcome, uh, welcomed initiative that has brought out audiences of up to 9,000 people uh, to over 100 shows across 50 locations in Dumfries and Galloway, and every year it goes from strength to strength. I'm particularly delighted this year to see Camille O'Sullivan, uh, one of the mainstays of the Edinburgh Festival, uh, appearing uh, in uh, Dumfries, and I'm delighted to have secured uh, my own tickets in a just uh, enough time before it sold out. But there really is uh, something for everyone uh, at the festival, and I'm sure, uh, unlike myself, Joan McAlpine and others will enjoy seeing uh, those such as, as, as Eddie Reader, uh, who has such a close affinity with Burns and um, Burns, uh, Burns's universal uh, nature and his ability to unite people certainly uh, goes a long way uh, to a, a long way in, in bringing together people who maybe don't always uh, agree on everything else uh, politically. But as the MSP for Dumfrieshire, uh, who and, and with Burns's really close connection to so many communities locally, there can be absolutely no denying his central importance to the local economy. I sort of find it amusing uh, often being out and about at places like the Brow Well. Uh, that sits just outside uh, Ruth, Ruthwell and you bump into all sorts of people who have found themselves from all different parts of the world, from different parts of Scotland, uh, visiting sites along the Robert Burns Trail. And I do think it's really important that we do uh, work harder and pull together all different initiatives on a cross-party uh, basis um, and, and, and take as much support as we can get from uh, the Scottish Government and Visit Scotland to make sure uh, that that trail is easy to follow, well promoted, and that people uh, know uh, just how much uh, there is to see across uh, a very interesting uh, part of Scotland. And it's often uh, tempting, uh, being from uh, Dumfries, to, to think that uh, Ayrshire uh, tries to steal uh, Robert Burns from us, and we've, we've still got him, uh, he's uh, still there in the mausoleum, but I think we've got to work better uh, as a region uh, as the South West uh, to, to, to promote uh, the, the shared link uh, that we have uh, and, and to make the most of bringing those visitors who make their way to his birthplace, uh, to, to encouraging them to follow the trail through his life and get them to, to, to travel to Dumfries as well. Um, there's much more modern uh, influences, uh, presiding officer. I was delighted uh, last year to attend uh, the opening of the Annandale Distillery uh, after 99 years and you see how important Burns is to the area and also uh, his significant uh, economic uh, draw uh, because they've chosen to name one of their two uh, new whiskies, Man of Words, uh, after uh, the Bard and it has a particularly uh, sort of special and sort of funny importance uh, because it is believed that Robert Burns uh, actually used to go there to collect his excise duties uh, when uh, the distillery was in its former life. And we also see, uh, I think it's important to reference, uh, as, um, as Alec Rowley has done, uh, young people continue to enjoy Burns and get involved in his legacy. And I think that it's really important that we look to maximize those opportunities for the future in this, the year of the young people. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague Joan McAlpine for bringing this debate to the Chamber and um, 
highlighting in her really interesting opening speech, not just the cultural, but also the economic benefits that um, Robert Burns brings us. Of course, without Irvin, there quite simply wouldn't have been a world famous poet called Robert Burns for us to debate today. And that's why I was surprised and actually a wee bit disappointed to have seen no reference to the town of Irvine on the website of the Centre for Burns Studies that the, the motion refers to. As I spoke about it at length last year, and, and make no apologies for repeating it today, Irvine is without doubt the cradle of the poet. In 1781, a young Robert Burns arrived in Irvine as an apprentice flax worker. By the time he left Irvine the following year, he had resolved to endeavour at the character of a poet, in large part due to his friend, the friendship that developed between Burns and a local sea captain, Richard Brown, who encouraged him to become a poet. So Burns the man may have been made uh, born in Alloway, but Burns the poet was born in Irvine. And thus it seems fitting that Irvine's home to the oldest Burns club in the world, with an unbroken history since it was first established in 1826. Later this month, Annie Small will be installed as the first ever female president of the club in its nearly 200 year history. As a lifelong egalitarian and as a man who expressed support for women's rights long before those views were even remotely fashionable, I'm sure that the Bard would have welcomed this as much as I do. As well as the oldest Burns club in the world, Irvine is home to the Wellwood Burns um, Centre and Museum which cares for a hugely impressive collection of Burns-related items, from priceless original manuscripts and letters to rare and significant books and paintings. Amongst the museum's collection are six of the original manuscripts which Burns sent to the printer John Wilson in Kilmarnock for his famous Kilmarnock edition. Visitors can also see the world-famous painting Burns in Edinburgh, painted in 1887 by C.M. Hardy as well as a set of five large oil paintings of scenes from Tam O'Shanter, commissioned by the club. The museum possesses original letters from Robert Burns to his friend David Siller, as well as a letter to Robert Burns from his brother Gilbert Burns, dealing with family and farming matters. And this is just a really small snapshot of the vast array of unique and priceless Burns-related items and artefacts held by our museum in Irvine a museum located in the heart of the very town where the poet was created. I trust, by now that members, I trust members by now will share my surprise and disappointment that Irvine Burns Club and Museum is not listed alongside the likes of the Burns Birthplace Museum um, and the National Library of Scotland as a must visit for Burns enthusiasts. It's often said that Irvine is the best kept secret in the Burns world and that certainly does seem to be the case. But I don't think we want it to be a secret any longer. We want it to enjoy national and international recognition, that recognition that it deserves. And we want to see Irvine take its place in the Burns-related cultural tourism hotspot that it rightly should be. So as Burns Day approaches, I'd like to extend an invite to the Cabinet Secretary and to the Minister, and indeed bearing in mind uh, Oliver Mundell's contribution to all of you in the Chamber, um, to come and see the magnificent collection in Irvine. Come and see the museum. I'll look forward to welcoming you all. Thank you. I now call Alistair Allen to, to respond to this debate. Your pleasure, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I firstly, as others have done, thank Joan McAlpin for bringing this motion to Parliament tonight and so allowing us all the chance to celebrate collectively the work of Robert Burns and his impact on, his, on our culture and on our economy. Now, this debate is framed around the impact which Burns has had on Scotland's economy, but as Ms McAlpine and other speakers have mentioned, uh, we remember not just how that economic impact operates, but also how it comes to exist. Burns is, as sometimes needs to be emphasised at this time of the year, a poet with an output at least as important as anything written by anyone anywhere in the 18th century world. It is an output which more than stands the test of time. And if his only work were Tam O'Shanter, so ably uh, performed by John Scott, then Burns' reputation would be assured, but of course he wrote much, much more. Burns wrote powerfully, not just as a Scottish patriot, but as a, a man passionately interested in internationalism, interested in the French Revolution and 
uh, American slavery, something now uh, demonstrated to pick uh, one exa illustration by a letter um, to Elizabeth Kemble, the well-known actress renowned for her uh, performance in anti-slavery plays. His anthem, Auld Lang Syne, is sung the world over from Times Square to Sydney Harbour, and as Ruth McGuire has been able to set the record straight, he has a special importance to, uh, to the people of Irvine. And it is Burns' sense of the importance of liberty for individuals and for peoples, and also his sense of uh, humanity and responsibility uh, for uh, one another that prevails today. And all from a man who would most probably have found himself in prison if he had too explicitly suggested that he might have the right to vote. The Robert Burns Humanitarian Awards are one way in which the Scottish Government seeks to reflect that legacy. It is a truly international legacy, as Emma Harper, Stuart Stevenson and many others have emphasised tonight. And so, working in partnership with Bemis Scotland, the Scottish Government uh, has provided funding to support the multicultural celebration uh, of Robert Burns, which uh, other speakers have referred to. But Burns is, of course, also an icon of Scotland, and as Miss McAlpin mentioned, uh, that has a direct impact on our economy, on our tourist industry, uh, indeed. And what some would call the Burns cult is itself part of our national culture. This began uh, in Burns' own lifetime, and the first Burns suppers were scarcely after Burns' lifetime. Burns was a celebrity and a rock star, as well as a thinker and a poet, and we overlook that at our peril. At times in the 19th century, admittedly, the Burns cult may have got slightly out of hand, long before the widespread celebration of Christmas in Scotland. At least one artist sought to depict the nativity of Burns in messianic terms, and some exhibitions of Burns' life in the past have at times resembled reliquaries. I have an early childhood recollection of visiting Alloway and seeing, amongst other things, some of them of questionable relevance, a sock believed to have belonged to Robert Burns. Now, I think that Scotland makes a much more concerted effort now as a country to share with the world Burns the man and the poet. We also do a pretty good job, I think, of explaining now just what Burns has meant for the Scots language and musical tradition. All that and more is now very evident from the hugely impressive Burns Birthplace Museum, which was supported by an £8 million grant from the Scottish Government. And in 2016, uh, that uh, museum attracted over 140,000 visitors to see its world-class collections. Now, this capacity to draw people to Scotland is truly significant economically, and the Burns season is important not just to our butchers and distillers, distillers, but also to our tourist industry. Likewise, Homecoming 2009, which celebrated the 250th anniversary of the birth of Robert Burns, attracted some 72,000 additional visitors to Scotland and generated net additional expenditure of £53 million. And can I agree with John Scott that we do need, uh, incidentally, to ensure that uh, uh, the undiscovered jewel that uh, is the southwest of Scotland is discovered by more people uh, and that Robert Burns is at the very heart of doing that. Events like the Big Burn Supper in Dumfries and Galloway have gained worldwide recognition and attracted talent and visitors from across the world. And as Miss McAlpin mentioned, uh, also uh, that gem among pubs that is the Globe Inn in Dumfries uh, is, is truly worthy of celebrating in its own right. Willie Coffey mentioned the huge impact that Burns has had on the economy of Ayrshire, and uh, in 2017, around 62,000 people attended the eight events celebrating Robert Burns, which were funded from Scotland's winter festivals. Burns Night 2018 is gearing up to be uh, an even bigger and better event. Now, on occasions like this, presiding officer, there is sometimes the temptation to fear that there might be some truth in McDermott's observation made, no doubt, after hearing a bad immortal memory that others to say has oft been said afore. But with a number of speakers, many of them representing uh, places in Burns' life, speaking eloquently today, I hope we, uh, we hope that we have confounded that expectation today uh, and have managed as a parliament to lay another modest stone on the cairn of Robert Burns. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.